Are we ready? Okay. Welcome everyone uh, right. to another virtual hybrid uh, in person and on the air uh, presentation. We're getting a little more used to doing these. Um, this is a part of our arts and medicine uh, programming, which is part of the arts and humanities and healthcare program. Um, I am standing in today for Dr. Tess Jones, and I have two tasks. One is to let you know about some upcoming programming on Thursday, May 19th, in the morning, 7 to 8 a.m. Uh, so you can tell this is designed around clinician schedules. Um, we're going to be talking about uh, five years into the medical aid in dying law here in Colorado, what have been the experiences of Colorado's physicians. Um, our research team here at the Center for Bioethics and Humanities did a very interesting uh, survey where they were able to sort of narrow down the people they were surveying to those most likely to have been involved in a medical aid in dying process. And so uh, it's a 300 person survey, but very enriched, if you will, for people with experience um, in this process in one way or another. And a very interesting finding. So that's Thursday, May 19th, 7 to 8 a.m. And the second one is just really cool. Uh, one of our young investigators, Dr. Christine Baugh, oh. Dr. Christine Baugh, um, who, uh, who was named the NIH Early Stage Investigator Lecturer uh, for this year. Um, and so she will be giving a talk for the National Institutes of Health called Understanding and Preventing Sport-Related Brain Injury Using a Public Health Prevention Framework. Um, she does super interesting work, and I'm very, uh, very excited for her uh, for this honor and award from the NIH. So today's program, uh, we, I'm going to turn things over to Dr. Mark Moss. Dr. Moss uh, is one of our intensivists and uh, very well known in his field uh, within intensive care medicine. He was the president of the American Thoracic Society a couple of years ago and has done really groundbreaking research in fields like of the acute respiratory distress syndrome. But the reason he's here today is because he also has become an expert on PTSD and burnout among ICU personnel. And uh, Dr. Moss is the creator, essentially, of the Colorado Resiliency Arts Lab, uh, which is a National Endowment for the Arts funded program to look at the impact of the arts on uh, indicators of burnout, stress, and so on in ICU personnel. So I'll turn things over to Mark and real. Oh, you already have a microphone. Thanks for the invitation and introduction, Matt. That was really nice. The one thing I want to point out, as Matt said, is um, the funded project from the National Endowment of the Arts. And it was put in as a collaboration between the University of Colorado, the Ponzu Creative Arts Therapy Program, which is located at Children's Hospital, and the Lighthouse Writers Workshop. So I want to have the other people that are sitting with me that are part of this collaborative introduce themselves. Why don't we start with you, Mike? Okay, great. Thank you. Um, my name is Mike Henry. I am the executive director and co-founder of Lighthouse Writers Workshop. We're a literary arts nonprofit center located in central Denver, uh, and we teach creative writing to anybody who wants to learn the craft. Uh, but more recently, we've been using creative writing as a tool to help individuals from traditionally marginalized or under-resourced communities. And Tony, do you want to introduce yourself? Sure. Uh, yeah, I've got a mic I'm mic'd up. Uh, yeah, so my name is Tony Edelblut. I am a music therapist. I'm one of the music therapists at the Ponzio uh, Creative Arts Therapy Program at Children's Hospital. Um, yeah, and I'm one of the three of us from our program in addition to Michael. Therapists for this study. So let me just go over what the outline is going to be of where the agenda, what we're going to talk about. First, Tony is going to give a general brief overview about what is creative arts therapy. Then we're going to show a video we made that's about the program. Um, and then um, Michael will talk about the Lighthouse um, component and the writing component of it. And Hilary Sin, who is one of our dance movement therapists that's been part of Carl since the beginning, is going to talk a little bit about the overall intervention that we did. Um, and then Tony will talk a little bit about the role of the 
group inner a group project and play a song for us that was a uh, came out of one of the group projects and i'll talk about the results of our clinical trial and then we'll leave plenty of time for questions so i'll turn it over to tony to give a brief overview of what is creative arts therapy great thanks mark um I'm wondering, would it be relevant to kind of talk about why you drafted us in the first place as I, as an introduction to me talking about what it is? Okay. So why don't you say one? So, so we were interested in um, wellness and burnout um, in, in healthcare providers for over 20 years. Um, and we kind of got to the point where we realized it's a problem. We don't need to keep doing surveys to show it's a problem. And what we wanted to do is start to come up with the interventions um, to try to treat um, uh, uh, and, and help patients or, and, or help providers that have um, psychological distress from their work. The grant um, proposals, uh, the applications came out from the National Endowment of the Arts, as Matt said, to look at how to bring together the arts and, um, and healthcare. So it seemed like a natural way of doing it. Um, through kind of a friend of a friend, I got put in touch with both the Lighthouse Writers Workshop and the Ponzio um, Creative Arts Therapy Program to see if we could take what they'd been doing in other cohorts of people and extrapolate it to healthcare providers. Great. Um, so uh, I'm off camera for the moment. <clears throat> I assume that'll change in a second because I know we have some presets, but I want to introduce uh, my colleague Hilary Sin, who has just joined us, she is the dance movement who worked on this project as well. There we are. There we all are. Yay. Okay. Um, so creative arts therapy. Okay. So some impromptu remarks about creative arts therapy. How about that? Okay. So um, yeah, creative arts therapy have been around. Uh, I, I I've listened to enough presentations. I think we've all sort of been around as established professions since about the end of World War II. Um, give or take. Um, obviously, the creative arts in general are uh, much older than all of that and have been used throughout antiquity uh, for ceremony, for uh, community building, for um, uh, all sorts of just enjoyment, right? So pleasurable listening and all that sort of thing. So, uh, but they've been around just uh, since, you know, the early part of the 20th century as established professions. Uh, we have, uh, I mentioned our creative arts therapy program, the Ponzio program at Children's Hospital. We have, and help me if I'm wrong here, we have music, art, movement, drama. We have expressive arts therapist, which I don't want to get in the weeds making those distinctions at this point, uh, but we do have an expressive arts therapist and yoga, right? So many things. I know I lose track. No, we, we've, we've been quickly growing in the last year, so I, I lose track. So. Uh, I think part of the key, and I wanted Mark to introduce it because um, <clears throat> one of our one of the things we talk about with creative arts therapy is that there, since it has been around forever, and that we all, you know, especially us working at Children's Hospital, uh, children want to make things, you know, and the act of making things is a pretty profound act that is hard to reduce to just like, <clears throat> you know, kind of causative. This causes this, and then here's the outcome. So we want to. I think in terms of research, sometimes we want to think very linearly, uh, but creative arts therapy kind of uh, has a complexity to it, right? Because uh, the act of expressing oneself has a lot of dimension to it. It has, uh, it has your internal states as part of it. Uh, the environment you're then expressing into is part of it. The thing that gets created is part of it. The relating that happens while this all goes down is part of it. Um, and that, that's a pretty complex uh, can be a pretty complex scene in a room if you just think about like a room where therapy takes place. So obviously we're doing that with the uh, creative arts therapies as the expressive medium, uh, whether that's music or dance or art or yoga or theater or all the things I said. Or even yoga is not necessarily expressive in and of itself, uh, but it does, it is that embodied in the moment kind of engagement. We're not just engaging about ideas, we're engaging about what are you making right now and what are you expressing? Which is, <clears throat> which is kind of a different question, I think, sometimes. Often gets asked in, in, in therapy. Um, I think, is there anything else I should say about the disciplines? I think, you know, no, I, we'll, I think, we'll get talking I think about that's that. great. That's a brief <clears throat> overview. David, I think we're going to turn it over to you. We're going to show a, 
a three minute video that talks a little bit more about our program. What is happening across the country is that healthcare professionals are getting exhausted. We don't really expect our healthcare professionals to admit that they are sad or to admit that they are tired, even. We, on a routine basis, deal with tragedy, death and dying in a very intense setting. Though there are clearly aspects of our job that we all love, that stress can get to you after a while. What do we do with the pain, with the trauma, with the sadness? What we found is that bringing creative arts therapy into the room, whether it's making music together, moving, dancing together, or making art together, there is a natural healing element that is a wonderful thing. This work is incredibly powerful and it can really change people's lives. Creativity and self-expression is really not only important for an individual's self-worth and health, but also gives them skills within their jobs. I think that this experience has taught me that we hold things in parts of our body that we aren't even aware of. If I don't know how to process, or if I don't have the words to talk about how difficult a day was, I now have an outlet that could help. If we as healthcare professionals can show that we can tackle this occupational mental health issue, then we can serve as a model for the rest of society to destigmatize mental health issues in general. I believe we can create spaces in every hospital where healthcare professionals can go and make art. And when we come together and we're actually in the same room with someone else, sharing stories, sharing vulnerabilities, making something new together, it steps away from isolation and steps into what is real and what makes us human. We have to connect together, to be together, to heal. David, thanks for showing that. That uh, gives an overview of kind of what the program's about. I'm going to now turn it over to Hillary Sin, who, as we talked about, is our dance movement therapist. And Hillary's going to give an overview of sort of the different themes that uh, were put into the different sessions and kind of what uh, participants did in each of the overall in the intervention in the program. I have two mics. <laughs> You're, you're so important, you get too much. So amplified. <laughs> um, so my name is Hilary Sin. I'm a dance movement therapist at Children's Hospital Colorado, and I work primarily in the psychiatric building over at Children's, um, working with kids and teenagers. Uh, as far as this project is concerned, uh, I created, along with all the other um, creative arts people here, um, a 12-week protocol each session was 90 minutes, and we had uh, dance movement, music, art, and writing. Um, for my part, I, I can't speak too much to what everyone else did, but we did have uh, collective goals that was the thread basically through the whole 12 weeks. So there was an arc to the whole process. So each one of us created um, sessions based on these common goals. Um, I did actually bring, a, not a dance, but I did bring just an example of something that I used in one of my groups. And I will say that I often use the other modalities to help support movement, because you can imagine people coming into a room um, to just start doing some free movement or expression with their bodies is really vulnerable, not particularly pleasant. Sometimes it creates some some stress. So I like to use um, line making, writing, um, music to help scaffold people's process of getting to the point of even being willing to move together. Um, I think it's the sixth session in, in my protocol. It's a session that is focused on, and all of us would have been focused on, looking at a particularly challenging moment at work or a particularly challenging shift. And in my group with dance movement, I borrowed from choreographer Bill T. Jones, 
part of his creative process for a piece he made uh, back in the 90s. Um, using an expressive line, dynamic line, to begin to tell a story, and then moving that line in space. So this is a line that I made up, um, and I don't know how visible this is. OK, thanks. So this line, it's one contiguous line, starts over here, traverses the page, has a few different directional changes, some different dynamics, and then ends all the way down here. And the idea here is that this captures perhaps either one moment of a shift at work or maybe even a full day. Once people create their lines, then we get up, and as if your body is the marker and the floor is the page, you move that line in space. So this is just one way of entering into um, expression in movement. Um, and the nonverbal piece of this is really important because, as you all know, um, confidentiality is always an issue in our work, um, as well as wanting to be sensitive to vicarious trauma as well. So you can communicate and express the feeling, the dynamics of a situation without having to use the words and getting into the, the details. So in my particular group, uh, the day we did this, everyone gets up, moves their lines, and I have them move it all at the same time, maybe individually, maybe in trios, maybe in dyads. What I wish you could see is the beautiful dance that is created. Um, and that is feedback from people in the room, seeing uh, their peers and their colleagues, having just made something beautiful from their own lives and from their own work. And I think that's what each of us do um, in, in, our, in our sessions. So that's just a little glimpse through my modality into this 12-week protocol. Um, like I said, Mike did the same thing with words, Catherine with visual marks and art, and Tony with music. That, that was great, Hillary. I'm going to turn it over to Mike to talk a little bit more about the writing part of it to complement what Hillary talked about, the dance movement. Thank you. Um, Hillary, that looks like quite a day. Yeah. <laughs> and that's amazing to see Every that. Day. Yeah, that's incredible. Um, so I, I led the, the cohort that focused on creative writing. And like Hillary said, it was a 12-week session um, broken down into three basic components. If I remember correctly, the, the first four weeks or so was just about getting people to feel comfortable um, getting to know one another, um, getting to start the practice of whatever the creative arts piece is going to be. Um, the second piece was just sort of developing that a little bit more. And then the third piece was really developing a sense of community, usually through a shared project. So for creative writing, the first four weeks really was just getting the participants to write and then to write some more and then to write some more. We early on introduced the idea of free writing, which is I'm sure there's a variant um, across all the different kinds of arts, where really the only goal of a free write is that it's timed. And so all you have to do is to keep the pen or pencil or cursor moving across the page. Um, I, I try to make that as, as clear as possible. So what they write doesn't have to be good. It doesn't have to make sense. It doesn't have to be grammatically correct. If you get stuck, I tell them, just write, I don't know what to write next. I don't know what to write next. Eventually, they'll get bored of that, and then they'll, they'll, they'll move on. Um, so it's really about instituting the practice in a way that frees them up. Um, I also try to get them to explore the idea of sort of random creativity. I think a lot of times people, especially who haven't practiced the arts a lot, um, and perhaps in certain professions, feel a level of perfectionism, right? And so. Um, I'm a big fan of the more random the writing prompt, the better. Um, and sometimes it's sort of bizarre. So I will, I will just randomly open up a book of poetry, give them a line and say, that's the first line of your free write. Um, take as much or as little of that phrase as you want and just keep going. And then sometimes I'll say, plus you also have to introduce a color, a name of a pet and the first car you ever drove or something like that. So 
what happens then is they're they're more focused on satisfying those sort of random requirements as opposed to thinking about how good the writing is going to be. Um, and we really focus on, on that in the first four weeks. And then I start to introduce um, some elements of craft about the writing process. So we'll do things we'll talk about. We'll do an exercise around dialogue, for example, which can be really, really fun, where the only thing you do is just dialogue back and forth between people. It can be remember dialogue or create a dialogue. Uh, we'll talk about character development. Think about some characters that you've met that you would like to do a character sketch for and then place them in a scene. We'll talk about um, writing using all five senses, you know, some of the basic elements and things like that. Um, in the beginning, I usually, I usually tell them, you don't have to write about work. You can write about anything you want, um, just to allow them just to get into that practice. And then I start gently encouraging them if they want to, to write about work, but I always say, you don't have to. Um, and then usually toward the end of that, that second four week session, um, I start to encourage them to write about work or the prompts are exactly that, right? So for example, as Hillary said, you know, at week six, I say, write about a really good day at work and write about a really bad day. Um, and use some of the elements that we talked about, like scene setting, character development, using senses and things like that. And then they just take off. And then the final four weeks, we talk about um, making it a practice. You know, I always start to, slowly suggesting like, what are you going to do after these 12 weeks are over? Are you going to continue journaling? Are you going to continue writing for yourself? Um, what is that going to look like? How are you going to prioritize in that in your life? But we also start talking about creating uh, a community project. And for us, that's an anthology of writing. So um, I'll, we'll start talking about what, what sorts of pieces have they written? What do they want to include in the quote unquote anthology because they're getting published? Um, and I'll encourage them to revise a version of something that they've written, and then they can bring it to class. And then we, um, we, we do sort of group feedback. We tend to focus really very, very much about the positives. Um, and then usually we'll say, you know, if there's something that you'd like to see more of as sort of the reading group, let's talk about that. Um, and what happens in that final four weeks is um, you really see, and actually throughout the whole piece, about how quickly they start to bond with one another. You know, these are usually total strangers that are sitting in a room together. And then they start, start sharing their stories and their creativity and supporting one another and hearing each other's work. Um, and it's really incredible. I think what happens is they move from that sense of isolation to that sense of community. So somebody will have written something and uh, somebody else would say, oh my God, I love that. That is exactly my experience. And let me write about mine. And I'm gonna tell you about my experience. So they really, really embrace that sense of community. And there's something alchemical about that process, which I really absolutely love. That, that was great, Mike. I, I just wanna add a little bit on to that before I turn it over to Tony. Um, we did some qualitative interviews with the people that participated in our program try to understand sort of what worked about the program and how we can enhance the program even better. Um, and there were a few themes that Hillary, Tony, and Michael brought up that came across in the qualitative interviews. The first is the sense of community. It was essential. People felt like they had a group of people that they could talk to and share things with. And in general, I think with the way that healthcare is practiced, especially during the pandemic, that sense of community has been eroded um, in, in medicine. So this gave people a sense of community. I think the other thing is we talked a lot about um, whether we would want to blend different healthcare professionals in these sessions. Um, I'll be honest, I was wrong. I thought that if we blended people together, the traditional hierarchy in medicine, which I don't ascribe to, but I understand exists, would inhibit um, expression from some of the people that felt that they were not at the same level, um, arbitrary level as some of the other people that were in the room. That was completely wrong, that theory, um, based on what um, the qualitative interview showed. People enjoyed seeing that doctors, nurses, behavioral health specialists, occupational therapists, social workers, we're all struggling with the same issues and that it transcended any one profession in healthcare. Um, and I think it actually ended up being a real strength, a 
as opposed to a, what I thought was going to be a potential weakness. Um, so the sense of community and broader community was important. The other thing is that we held the sessions at the um, uh, Lighthouse Writers Workshop building, which is this great old building um, on Race Street. And one thing that came across in the qualitative interviews is it was important to get away from work and to separate these from work and to feel, as Hillary was saying, that people had a safe space where they could talk about some of these issues and themes and problems they were having in confidence and getting away from the Anschutz Medical Campus was part of the success of that um, or getting away from their work environment. Um, and, and then I think the, the other thing that came across was people viewed this as a combination of art therapy and sort of group therapy. And when we asked the, the participants, well, what if we got rid of the art part of it and just had it be a group therapy? Everyone said, no, 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 no. We need the art part of it. It gives us our voice to express the things that we need to express to get to the therapy part of it. So it was very clear that this, this merging of art therapy and providing support on a psychological way for people that have extreme psychological distress from their work um, was important to blend the two. So I wanted to kind of point out those themes that came across in the qualitative interviews. Um, I'll now turn it over to Tony, who will talk a little bit more about the role of the group projects. And then, as I said, play a result of one of the group projects. All right, thanks, Mark. Um, so yeah, the group project, when we're talking about creative arts therapy and we're talking about anything that's uh, experiential like that, uh, when we get to the group part of sort of the, the group phase of our group, as Michael uh, started to talk about that, uh, the 12 weeks are broken down into kind of three units and the last of which is that uh, group project. And part of what's important for these folks coming in uh, or coming, going out, I should say, is that the action of being part of a community, I mean, it's an action, it's a thing you need to practice. It's not just, we don't all mess naturally do it, otherwise we'd already be doing it, right? Um, I, or I should say, we all do it naturally, but sometimes with work stressors and with the kind of isolation of our culture at times, and I'm just commuting and going to my job and coming home, and, and especially with pandemic, and I'm just isolated, uh, is that community is, a, is an action to be practiced. So we do that together. Um, We've already spent so much time time talking about what's my personal experience, um, really appreciating other people's experience, um, and how am I going to put that together? Because one of the things I was thinking about is that um, creative arts therapy has a lot of paradoxes in it, which is one of them is that I'm going to express myself a lot, but I'm also just gonna, then going to listen to other people expressing themselves more than I normally would. As much as I don't normally express myself all the time, I don't also don't sit around and listen to other people's expression. So that's one paradox is that's both from me and coming at me. And I think, um, uh, what was my other one that I had? Is that uh, in order to do that, I need to feel a little bit vulnerable, right? And, and, and my nervous system is built for not making me too vulnerable, right? So I have to both be vulnerable and then speak anyway, right? And that's another one of these actions that we need to practice in all the, in all the creative arts is there's, there's what's inside of me, but then there's that action of expressing it outwardly. And that's a very scary step. That's a big deal for everybody who's in our groups. So, um, so the project is really about the group coming together and, and, and trying to find uh, both commonality and differences in people's experiences. And how are we gonna put that together into something? So uh, I know with uh, Michael's uh, writing group, Catherine's art group, uh, there's the creation of books, and that's a nice way to kind of put everything into a single work. Um, Hillary's had, you know, I know that Hillary and I, it's more in the moment, we're a little more floaty with how, with how that goes as a final project, but I, um, I, have, I have set, just for my curriculum, the way I wrote it, since I like to write songs, um, is that I kind of try to play to that strength and that passion of mine in terms of uh, music therapy. So what I'd like to do is I'm going to play one of the songs that, uh, from one of the, it was the second of the three cohorts last year. Um, and we had done a bunch of uh, writing processes that I like to do for brainstorming lyrics, and we had been playing music and expressing things non-verbally through music for weeks and weeks and weeks. So um, it came time to write the song, and we had so many ideas uh, ready to put together. Um, but 
the way that this particular song turned out, we ran out of time in the session where we were doing this. So they said, you write it. I'm like, okay, since they didn't, not, there were no kind of self-endorsed musicians in the group. Uh, so I took all the ideas and I tried to cram them uh, into uh, one song. So what I will tell you about the song as you're listening is that I'm gonna open up with a little uh, riff that kind of repeats over and over. Uh, I wrote that for my group members to sing because I didn't expect them to sing verses and choruses and all that sort of thing with no musical training. Uh, so you'll hear the little repeating thing I sing at the beginning and that comes back several times. You, have, you can imagine that's like my group of non-musicians singing behind me. And then there's also in the bridge, there's like, I'm, I'm probably gonna try to lean back a little bit and shout no, and those no's are also shouted by the people in playing the song. So just some performance notes. All right, we haven't really tested this, so we'll, we'll, I hope that this goes together. Can you hear that? You and me, it will lead. You and me, it will lead. Here it comes, another message. So much news that I'm dreading. I stop to breathe for a second. Gambling. Why do I jump to conclusions? Sorry. Not sure how I use them. I'm not sure what the truth is. Don't grant me the grace to occupy my own space and always ways up. I do my best for me and you equally can't pour from an empty cup. You and me equally, you can't drink from an empty cup. You and me equally. You and me equally, I declare that I'm sufficient. So many times when I didn't, balance taking and giving. Yeah. You can't blame me if I'm shaking all the shifts I have taken. So my joy is awake now. Yeah. We'll stay silent. No, it doesn't matter what they think. No, we'll hold on in. No, we'll up until the break. What? No, we'll stay silent. that song it just gets better and better it's my pop hit yeah it's, <laughs> um so that's what came out of out of the, the groups um and you can he, you can hear the message there you can't drink from an empty empty cup that's really the way i think many of us feel when we're at work especially during the pandemic some of us working on the front lines just take take a step back a little bit. Why, why did the National Endowment of the Arts give us funding to do this? Really what they wanted and what they want from these programs called research labs is they want to provide the evidence that the arts are important. What they realized is it's nice to tell people it seems like it works. It's a lot more valid and powerful if you say we studied this and it actually does work. So what they wanted um, was to bring together research scientists and the arts community to give proof to the National Endowment of the Arts so they can go to Congress and say, this really does make a difference. So that's what our Carl group was about. What we did is, as Hillary, Tony, and Michael said, is we were very rigorous about creating protocols. Um, and we got external um, assistance from experts in the field through an iterative process. The first thing we did is we created the protocols. And then we set up a randomized clinical trial. 
Um, that was a pilot trial to really show, can we do this? What are the barriers to, to doing it? And we randomized um, close to 150 healthcare professionals. We were initially focused on ICU healthcare professionals because that's what I do and there's a lot of stress working in the intensive care unit. But then the pandemic hit and we realized the whole world stressed out and all healthcare professionals are stressed out. So we opened it up from not just intensive care unit healthcare professionals, but anyone in healthcare. Um, and we had wait lists. People wanted to do this. Um, people, um, I've never had that happen in studies before that people are like, how do I get in to this study? Um, people were randomized to a control group where they filled out questionnaires before a 12 week period of time and after the 12 week period of time, or they were randomized to one of the four interventions dance movement, visual arts, writing, and music therapy. Um, and as everyone said, it was a 12-week program, 90-minute sessions. And the major outcome variables we were looking for were, did people show up? Did people like it? And then as a secondary outcome, we wanted to see, was it effective? Really more to see kind of what effect sizes we saw. Well, first of all, people showed up. On average, people showed up to nine and a half of the 12 sessions. This is in addition to their work day. So after a busy day at work, they went to the Lighthouse Writers Workshop building and participated in these sessions for 90 minutes. When we looked at um, satisfaction surveys, these satisfaction surveys go from a score of eight to 32. The average overall score for the group was 31. People loved it. People enjoyed I shouldn't say loved it. People saw the value in it. It's, this is not always enjoyable, but people saw the value in it and thought it was very, very important to what they did. Most importantly, not what we were planning on doing is, is it effective? So when we compared the people that participated in the four groups and overall, there were 146 um, participants either in the control group or into one of the interventions in a four to one randomization. Um, we were able to show that the people that were randomized to the intervention groups had a 26% reduction in their symptoms of um, depression, a 38% reduction in their symptoms of anxiety, a 28% reduction in their symptoms of PTSD, and a 12% reduction in some of the burnout scores. This is at the same time that in the control group that really just completed the questionnaires pre and post, um, some of the scores increased because they weren't getting the support they needed and they were getting worse over that 12 period of time, um, 12 week period of time. The other way to look at it is that there are cutoffs for these symptoms of anxiety, depression, um, post-traumatic stress disorder and burnout. And if you look at the people in the control group, at the beginning, 72% had symptoms of anxiety. And at the end of the intervention, only 39% had symptoms of anxiety. So that's a pretty dramatic reduction. In terms of depression, it went from 25% down to 7%. When you look at some of the components of burnout, it went from 54% down to 38%. So people got better um, after the 12 week period of time. So they showed up, they liked it or saw the value in it. And at least in this pilot study, they were compared to a control group where they just filled out the questionnaires before and after, there was improvement in their psychological distress from participating in the group in a randomized clinical trial. And the results of this, we just found out, were accepted in one of the medical journals called the American Journal of Medicine, which is a pretty fairly well prestigious um, general medicine, general internal medicine journal. Um, so that those were sort of the results that we we found um, in terms of next steps. Um, we're going to try to roll this out in general, um, and we're going to look to try to do a larger multi-center trial and get funding, probably maybe from the NIH for that. So we'll stop there and um, leave some time for questions, which I realize are probably the most important part of a session like this. So Matt, I'm not sure if you want to take questions from the audience or 
from the online, et cetera? Yeah, let's, um, well, let's, can you turn me down? Thank you. Yeah, let's see if there are um, questions from within the room. If there are not, I have three. Okay. Yeah, what? Um, if, yeah, if you're on the mic, you, they can hear it online, right? You have to hold the button down. I don't really have a question. I just <laughs> wanted to say thank you so much. I've got a really good representation here of the Marcus Institute for Brain Health. My colleague, Lisa, who's a neurologist, Molly, who is dance, music, yoga, Carrie, who's an art therapist like me. So we just wanna say thank you so much. This is what we've all known for a long time and to be able to see it come out in a study with those numbers that are so exciting. <laughs> like we're all just thrilled to have you guys doing this and we're cheering you on from the sidelines. That's all. Thank, thanks, Gail. I mean, it is, it is you, you always know something works or you think it works, but it's really nice to have some evidence that it really does make a difference. Yes, thank you for that provocative question. <laughs> <We'll go. laughs> Unbelievable. Um, yes, I'm Molly. It's wonderful. I'm also a dance therapist. So it's, there's so few of us. It's nice to meet you. Um, my question, as far as, like you said, next steps in research, is there interest to look at the program on telehealth as the world kind of shifts to telehealth and clinical aspects and creative arts therapies? Um, it's a really good question and something we talked about because we were ready to start the intervention in March of 2020. And again, I, I say a lot of things that I think are correct and wrong. I'm like, I think we're going to be fine. And then the state got shut down four days later and we weren't fine. Um, so we had to stop that and sort of reconsider. And at the time we thought about doing it online, but we, we thought it was more important to do it in person. But I'll turn it over to... You know, you, if you want to talk about the value of in-person versus online or your impression. I want more mics. Yeah. <laughs> um, but they're two very different experiences, as you know, and something's better than nothing. So personally, this is, we have not discussed this as a group, but I think that would be exciting to find a way to, to that. All I have to say about that. Other questions, Matt? Um, I wondered if there were differences between the modalities. You're offering four quite different experiences. Um, did you explore at all what the experiences were between the modalities? And if there are certain ones that are stronger for certain types of outcomes or for people experiencing certain conditions? That's a really good question. So the first thing to, to, uh, to answer that, Matt, is that we gave people the ability to rank the programs they wanted to be a part of. Um, we learned in previous other studies that people can do almost anything, but it works probably a little bit better to put them in something that they're maybe a little bit more interested in. So people got to rank order and most people got their first or second choice. Um, we did look at the differences in each of the individual modalities versus the control group. And in general, the effect size that we saw in the different modalities were all basically the same. So we had enough, it's amazing with, it was such a strong effect that even with subgroups of 30 people in each group, we still saw differences in improvements in psychological distress compared to the control group. So I think, Part of that is putting people in groups of areas that they're interested in um, is probably more effective. Um, and when you do that, it seems like all the modalities seem to work. It's a very good question. How are, are there ways to proactively recommend certain people for certain groups? We've not thought about that, but that's something we could think about doing in the future. I would like to also add to that. I think that we would need to do more studies yeah. of that because at this point there's four therapy, well, five now because we had an art therapist substituting who have actually delivered the curricula. So, um, you know, to really be able to generalize and say music does this and art does this, um, et cetera, would, uh, is a pretty large uh, leap. Yeah. 
We've had a, a number of requests, both in the chat and the Q and A. If you would mind repeating the numbers, oh. Oh, okay. um, people really wanted me to put them in the chat, and unfortunately, I yeah. didn't write them down as you were saying them. So again, when you look at the percent improvement in scores for anxiety, it was twenty eight percent. For depression, it was thirty six percent, and for P I think I might have had them. And for PTSD, it was twenty six percent. And for um, emotional exhaustion, depersonalization, it was 11 and 14% improvements in the intervention group. And some of the control groups got worse. For example, the P, uh, post traumatic stress disorder score in the control group went up by 10%, where in the intervention group it went down by 25%. So, pretty dramatic improvements in um, what you would see. Now, again, it's not a blinded study, the control group. Um, didn't have an intention control where they went and did something for the same amount of time. So there are way, ways to address the issue. I also wanna just add one thing to what Tony said, which is really important. Um, we wanna make sure that this is not a Hillary sin intervention. We wanna make sure it's a dance movement intervention or a Michael Henry or Tony Edelblut intervention. So we have to make sure that we can teach other trained professionals to do the intervention. And that's something we have to work on. A couple of people have asked about the choice of modality. And uh, I assume the, the, the purpose of randomizing people was scientific, but it does leave the question, what if people were able to select the modality that they were entered into yeah. might that have had a different and I, so i'm asking for speculation but what do you think about the role of choosing yeah. your modality they were able to choose their modality so they gave a rank order list of one to four of which modality they would be preferred to be in they were also given the possibility if they really really didn't want to do something to not rank that and then that was put into a randomization scheme that they either got their highest choice or got randomized to the control group. So we took into account both those issues, Matt, that people did sort of get to choose. And then after their choice were either randomized to one of their highest choices or to the control group. And any differences between people who got their choice and oh. people who were randomized to a choice they'd prefer not to Yeah, we, we didn't. We have not looked at that. Um, I, I, we can do that. We, well, in subgroups, what we looked at is if people showed up to nine or more sessions versus less, where there are differences to look at a dose effect. This numbers are small, but it doesn't seem to be that way. The, the one group that was the most represented was nurses compared to others. And we looked at that. It seemed like it was not just that nurses saw the benefit from it. Um, so, but that's something we can do, Matt. I didn't, we didn't look at that. Um, there are folks wondering whether more detail on the protocols that you each used with the groups, will that be in the publication or is it available? It's, so I submitted it, or I was just, we submitted to the journal because sometimes they want those. Um, this journal actually, uh, the American Journal of Medicine didn't, um, they would have been happy, but so, we didn't send it, they, they're not gonna publish that. So I think what we need to figure out is how to publish it in a different way. But I would recommend if people are interested is reach out to us, we'd be happy to share anything with you. Um, the other thing I would, I would add, because I think we've kind of inferred it, but I wanna say really clearly that the four of us clinicians who started it, we sat down in a room together and created the goals for each of the 12 weeks, like the, Three main sections with each with four subgroups. And so we didn't even build our curricula until we had agreed on the sort of the arc of the of, of their therapy. So just to put that in there, that, that the goals were created first and then the you know are fleshed out afterwards. Yeah. It strikes me that your um, intent to make sure that this is replicable, that it's not a unique effect of the really talented people sitting on the stage right now, um, hinges a little bit on having a protocol that someone else could pick up. And as long as they're trained properly, they could implement that anywhere else. 
that that was the goal, Matt. That's where we started, and it probably took six to eight months for us to do that. It, it took a while. I mean, it was a real iterative process. And I think the other thing to point out, and I'll see, but if people agree with this, is that what we wanted is that people in general would get the same experience regardless of which modality they were in, where the goals as, and the, the themes were the same, the difference was people might feel more comfortable in one modality or one medium than the other. But would you, would you guys agree with that or? Yeah, yeah, I, I would say so. I mean, it, you know, um, and just sort of sort of full disclosure, um, I'm not a trained therapist. I have an MFA in creative writing. And so um, working with the, the three trained therapists was an incredibly wonderful learning experience. Um, and so I think it was great to sit down and actually talk about, you know, week by week, what is the progression that we want to take um, all of the participants through no matter what the art form is. Um, and I thought that was really kind of it was fascinating for me to do, but I thought it was, it, it's a pretty solid framework. One of the, the audience members online is asking if you have advice for recent grads who would like to enter this field of arts therapy. Uh, are there programs now where you get trained in this? Yep, there are programs across the country. You just have to, you'd have to look those up. Um, there are national organizations for each of the modal. I don't know about writing, but for the other three, there are national organizations that kind of, uh, well, there's like the unifying organizations as a credentialing organization. So there's all of that infrastructure set up. So um, I, I, I'll speak for music therapy, and I'm looking at Hillary, but uh, I know that music therapy has moved toward more, um, you really want to be at least starting your curriculum as an undergraduate. Uh, then, you know, and then as a graduate, you can. Hillary, do you have anything to add to that? Is there anything different from a dance movement standpoint? Do it, yeah, just do it. Look it up, do it. Do it. <laughs> um, what are the long-term impacts of this? Do you, ex or do you, what do you anticipate to be the long-term impacts? Are there people who, you know, are now uh, taking dance on a regular basis because they got introduced during this and it was so therapeutic and beneficial that they've continued on? Yeah, it's, it's a really important question. So what we're doing is, having the participants fill out four, eight, and 12 month evaluations to see if the effect of the 12 week program continues on. I would guess, I mean, we'll see what the data shows. That's cool. Do you want me to, oh. Okay. Um, so to, to see if the effect remains, um, I would guess it, probably doesn't um, because that's why we you know, but that's why we're going to study it in general most behavioral interventions wane over time if people don't continue to do it but we'll see um, so we'll have that data probably in the next few months Kristen in July when the last group fills finishes up their 12 week surveys um, and then we can see in terms of if people continue to do things or not the one thing I would say, again, in the qualitative interviews is that that came out as people want to continue to do this. They're like, you know, like I've lost my community. How do I keep it together? So whether we um, in the future would continue to do this on a monthly basis or something along those lines is something I think we would want to consider. But I don't know if the three of you have any anecdotal experience of people continue to do things or not. Um, I tried to um, provide courses in the community, dance resources where people could go in the community if they wanted to seek that out on their own. Um, I think that community piece that we created during the 12 weeks is important, as is the larger community in connecting people to arts in the community in general, I think would be a, a great way to explore. And it's also kind of part of our charge as a lab with the NEA to form these relationships between the arts community and, and healthcare. So um, yeah, I think there's, there's that piece too. Yeah. Well, the, the part that I always wanna add is that, um, is that while we are rightfully bragging about the, the, um, the lowering of burnout scores, 
uh, a couple anecdotal things that happened for my group is that people made very decisive moves in their life. Like, oh, I'm really burnt out and I'm not happy and we're sitting here talking about it. So I, I think it was my first cohort, I literally had two people who quit their jobs and moved back to be near their families. Because, because that community, they were like, I'm away from my community, what am I doing here? Right, I need to be with people that I love and the you know, nieces and nephews that are growing up whose lives I'm missing and all that. So I, you know, and I actually take that as good news in addition to the lowering of burnout scores, which is that people are making very decisive moves about what makes them happy. Yeah, and I would say, um, just to sort of echo what Hillary said, the idea of continuing that community outside of the research study is incredibly valuable. For example, at Lighthouse, we've had a, a weekly workshop at the main branch of the Denver Public Library called Hard Times, and it's just a, a weekly free writing workshop. It's been running for almost four years now, and it's for people experiencing homelessness or extreme poverty. And there's a core group in that, in that, in that cohort that has been together since the beginning. There's probably six or eight writers that have been there. Um, and so the idea that they find community there and they see the value in it and they just keep coming back session after session, I think is incredibly valuable. We just have a couple more minutes. Um, yeah, go ahead. Hi, so um, this is kind of outside of the scope of what you've done, but just curious in, um, you know, I know we all agree that healthcare workers have been impacted by the pandemic in pretty unique ways. Mm -hmm. But I was just thinking too about other um, occupations that might be affected by things like burnout, you know, fragmented sense of community, these things you were looking at. So first responders, teachers, those kind of occupations came to mind. Um, have you considered any way in which this 12 week protocol, the things you've developed, how that those could be applied to other populations, other occupations? I was just gonna say, heck, yeah, I think at one point we did talk about first <laughs> yeah. responders, yeah. you know, it's like, let's do that and teachers for sure. Um, there's so there's so many different communities that are under high stress and um, again, the, there's incredible value of offering this to them. Yeah, I, the only thing I would add that we need it to be focused by necessity. So we wanted to make sure we kind of, from a research standpoint, focused on one group, but absolutely, I don't think there's anything unique about healthcare professionals and the stress they have in their job that are that different than other groups that you talked about. I think we'd probably have to adapt the protocols and some of the prompts, um, but I think that would be a, a, a very reasonable next step to consider. Just to end with the question that has come up in the chat, but it also arose as you were giving those numbers again. Um, if this were a pill, this would be a miracle drug, yeah. right? If the arts were a pill, you would you would be um, in front of the FDA with those numbers right now, getting an emergency use authorization. <laughs> um, and so the question arises: How do we implement this when there's no payment model for this? And so one of the people asked, you know, how would you do this if you didn't have a grant from the National Endowment for the Arts. It's 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 hard, Matt. I mean, to be honest with you, I think one thing we've noticed is, um, well, let me let me back up one second. So it's a pilot study. It's preliminary data. It does look pretty remarkable, but there are certain things that we need to explore before we come to the conclusions that people are coming to. Number one is that the control group, as I said, did nothing in in terms of in terms of interventions so somebody could criticize the study that we did and say it's not really the creative arts therapy you can get people together something like we did in the in a previous study as a control group and have a book club and just maybe it's just the sense of community and it's not really the creative arts therapy so that's one thing we need to test the other thing as we alluded to is i want to make sure this is not a michael hillary Tony and Catherine, Courtney and Tisha intervention. Those were their therapists. So the question is, can we really roll this out to other people? So those are things that we need to do. What are the barriers to implementing this? And I think part of it is, I think the biggest barrier is time. And, and the, the, the thing that we've noticed is it's, it is hard to get people after a long day at work to do something outside of work that's helping them do their job better. 
And what's been difficult, and I understand it, is to convince healthcare systems to embed this into someone's job description so that this is what you do as part of your job, not this is something you have to do on top of and outside of your job. And I think as a first step, I think the Children's Hospital and possibly the University of Colorado Hospital are interested in sort of trying to take one step forward to try to implement this and see um, if we can make this happen. But I think once it becomes outside of somebody's job description, it becomes harder to implement it. So people talk about individual and organizational therapies for wellness. I think you have to meld those together into one concept of intervention because individual things won't work if the organization doesn't buy into it. Well, thank you all so much for this really important provocative work. I hope uh, it is replicated. If again, if we had uh, if we had a pill that took PTSD and cut it in half, and took depression and cut it in half, that's way better than any existing pill. That's better than ketamine. That's better. Than... <laughs> so, uh, best of luck moving this forward, and we re really look forward to the uh, six and twelve month data. And thanks for the invitation. <laughs>